Blue Chew is here to help you unleash your inner confidence and take your performance to the next level. Say goodbye to those awkward pharmacy encounters or scheduling doctor's appointments. Blue Chew is prescribed online and delivered discreetly to your door. Visit bluechew.com and score your first shipment for free by using the code HOLLY. Just cover a small shipping fee of $5. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. Uh, I want to introduce my guest today, who I am so thrilled to have here. She is one of the top, if not the top, trans performer working right now. Please welcome the incredibly beautiful, the 2023 AVN Trans Performer of the Year, Emma Rose. Hey, I'm so happy to be here. I'm so excited to have you. You are even like more beautiful in person. Oh, it's thank you! Like really, quite remarkable. Your I, skin is insane. Uh, I literally spend so much uh, time working on my skin every night. Like I feel like it's my ritual. I probably spend like like forty five minutes getting ready for bed, but then I'm exhausted at the end. Yeah, <laughs> it's a good it's a good wind down. Yeah, time watching Netflix. I might have to like hit you up about that because I have like terrible eczema going on under my eyes right now because I wore professional makeup the other day and getting all the eye makeup off like oh my god yeah and it just like sits and like clogs everything yeah and I, I think I just rubbed too hard so mm. now I look 80 no you don't no I do but it's <laughs> fine skin cycling I feel like I learned from TikTok and I've kept it and it's like instead of using everything all in one day you like do it on like a three day or a four day pattern and literally like my skin has never looked better. Wait, really? Yeah. So instead of using like exfoliation and retinol and moisturizers and all this, like you you put it like active ingredients for the day. So the first day is exfoliation. The second day is retinol. The third day is like about like moisture. And then the fourth day is rest. And it's like it actually gives your chance, your skin a chance to breathe. Huh. So it's actually really good. <laughs> wow. Okay. I really am going to bother you about that yeah. afterwards because my my audience is 96% men and they are so not going to give a shit about this, this conversation. Like, skip, 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 skip. <laughs> skip, skip. Um, thank God for show notes. <laughs> uh, TikTok's amazing. Just the things you can learn from TikTok. Oh my God. I love TikTok. <laughs> it's incredible. It's incredible. Okay. Well, let's talk about you. So Give us, you know, your origin story. How did you start in sex work? So um, I started in sex work right when I turned uh, 19. I broke up with my first ex at the time and I was in college. I was going for marketing and it was right before summer. And I'm like, what do I do? And so I was talking to my friend and that was before my transition. Mm -hmm. So I was still a boy at the time and uh, I started go going. Um, and then that led into kind of like escorting at the time as before my transition and then um when i transitioned in 2017 at the very last semester of my um college um i started dancing at some of the trans clubs in florida mm -hmm. um even though there was only like one which is players club in tampa and then club atomic and uh Wars club extra in fort lauderdale and then during that time i was like dancing uh traveling for about like three years i think yeah three years until 2020 and then uh, a director kept on hitting me up, hitting me up about working uh, for porn. And like my initial reaction was like, I don't want to ruin my life with porn because like, yeah, I didn't want out there forever. At least with dancing, it was easy to keep it under wraps. People right. wouldn't find out. And then um, definitely I was kind of getting tired of dancing, the long hours, just the talking to the guys. It was kind of like nothing that I was working towards, like no goals. And then COVID started happening. So I was like, sure, I'll do this. And yeah. then I did my very first scene in January. Uh, and as, of 2020? 2020, yeah. Okay. And as soon as that went out, um, like Evil Angel hit me up. And I was like, oh my God, like all these companies like Groovy. And... Um, so I shot for Evil Angel in February and then Groovy in March and then everything shut down. Mm -hmm. So I was like, okay, well, I guess I'm not going to dance anymore because I didn't think that shipping was going to happen any anytime soon after COVID. Mm -hmm. So I made the decision just to move to Vegas, packed all my things and just left. <laughs> wow. And 
let me guess. Did you open an OnlyFans? Uh, I had an OnlyFans from 2019. Okay. But I wasn't really active on it. But during COVID, it was like that was when I became really, really active. Mm -hmm. And now my OnlyFans is doing really, really great. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of like the story for everyone, right? Yeah. I think everybody went to this place where they realized like they could actually be very Mm self-sufficient on this platform. And I still have a lot of fans that are from like that time when they joined during COVID Uh and I still have them. I talk to them all the time. So yeah. Nice. (laughs) Yeah. So tell me about your first scene. Like who was that with? What was your thought process going into it? Was it what you expected it to be? So my very... My very first scene was with Christian Triplex. Um, okay. So he works with a lot of new models. Mm-hmm. Like he scours like high and low for all the trans girls. Yeah, he's and, been on this podcast. Yeah. So, and I've actually known him for a long time. We used to shoot him a lot back in the day. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. yeah he's been in the industry forever. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we were going back and forth between Price because I was like, no, this is my first scene. I want to like, I just, I was very nervous, but also I was very like, like stubborn about what I was gonna get, of course. Uh, but it was really nice because um, like he's always treated me with respect, and um, we did two scenes the first day and then a scene the next day, and it was kind of it was nice because it was just one person, mm-hmm. uh, and it was just like his photographer, so it was really lo- like chill and low key. But my Evil Angel shoot with Joey Silvera, that one was my second shoot ever. And that one was very, like, that was with Dante Cole. And I'm like, I've seen Dante Cole for years. And I was, like, shaking and sweating. And I was so nervous. Oh, my God. Yeah. But were you happy at the end? Oh, I was really, really happy. Except that scene didn't come out until, like, a year later. Interesting. It was, yeah, it was very interesting because after... Becoming um, a contract star for Chains Angels, and I was in there for like probably six months at that point. And mm-hmm. then that one came out, and I was like, oh my god, it was like one of my very very first scenes. And like just from that point to like a year in, I was already a completely different performer, mm-hmm. and now I'm a completely different performer now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Did you look at that scene and think like, I'm like, how, what was your reaction? Were you kind of horrified because you could see? Like yeah. the newness and the mistakes and that kind of thing. I just feel like I looked nervous. Like yeah. I, I wasn't very confident. I was like, mm. it was still good, yeah. but it wasn't like that. Definitely wasn't my best. <laughs> yeah. When did you? Is there a scene where you felt like you hit your stride and you were like, okay, now I know what I'm doing. This is, you know, I got this. It was when I shot my first browser scene with Angela White. Okay. Uh, and like we're just like fucking and like switching. It was just like super hot and even like the director was like, oh my God, this is great. We're just going to let you do whatever you want because like they didn't really direct us or like move us around. Mm-hmm. And at that point was when I was like, okay, wow, I just shot with Angela White and I shot for browsers and it was also my debut lesbian scene. It was my very first mm-hmm. lesbian scene. And at that point, um, I was so nervous working with women because like I worked with Kinder Lust back in 2020 and like I always say that she's my lesbian awakening, but at the same time it was very awkward mm-hmm. and like new and I didn't know anything. Mm-hmm. And now I'm like a really, really big girl, girl performer. Mm-hmm. That must have been, I mean, Angela's amazing. Oh, she's amazing. <laughs> yeah. It's funny. I like, I always, I always joke that we should just rename this podcast. Everyone loves Angela White. Because <laughs> anytime I have anybody on, I'm like, who's your favorite scene? And it's like always Angela. Angela. Yeah. It's just like, she's, she's just so just, genuine and like, so like sensual and mm-hmm. like, she can go between like sensual to like hardcore, like mm-hmm. fucked all back to sensual. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, oh my God, whiplash. I think that that's, that's that's one of like the things that you can really, that's what sticks out in my mind when people ask me, you know, what she's like a performer is, is genuine. Like I've shot so much porn over the last 25 years and there's something about, you see it in her eyes. Like she is, she's very excited to be there. She's very into whoever she's working with. Like she is like all in. It's not like, it's not an act. Yeah. It's really interesting. Her and uh, Phoenix Marie. Yes. Phoenix Marie is, she is just firing her soul. And she is just, I'm like, ruin me, please. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any other favorite performers that you like working with? Um, Now I'm trying to think. I, I love Phoenix Marie. I always get so like shy and like submissive with her. She's very uh, dominant. Yeah. She's a very dominant person. And then Magnolia for sure. Yeah. Um, I remember the director was like, can y'all like refrain from like having sex off camera? And I was like, that's fine. And like me and her just like, I fucking the whole entire time. And finally when it's time to like shoot 
It was so good. It was with September Rain. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was a threesome. It was amazing. Uh, also, so guys, one of my favorite people to work with, of course, is Dante Cole because mm-hmm. uh, he's just reliable. And I think like one time I was late for a scene because my flight got delayed three times. Mm. I got there at five. My flight was leaving at nine. It was for Trans Angels. And like we shot everything, pictures, sex, everything within like an hour and a half. And I've never worked that fast before. Yeah. And like he's just always so good. He <laughs> is great. Yeah. yeah. No, we love Dante. We've also had him on this podcast. Uh-huh. In fact, um, so let's go back and let's talk about your transition. Mm-hmm. Um, so when did you first realize that you were born into the wrong body? So I never met anyone who was trans until I was 19. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I grew up on a farm. Like I grew up like country, not like Arkansas country, but like central Florida. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I had a cattle and goats and everything. My parents were really Southern. But um, I think that... I looked back after I transitioned and I noticed all the parts that would make sense. But mm-hmm. during the time, I didn't know because I didn't have the words for it. Mm-hmm. So, like, when I was a kid, I thought, like, it was just a regular thing for gay boys to, like, think of themselves as women in the future. Mm-hmm. So when I was thinking of myself as, like, like working as an adult, I was always thinking of myself as a businesswoman or as a wife. Like, I would always just have, like, images of me just living as a woman mm. instead of, like, a man. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was just normal, and it definitely wasn't. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then uh, when I transitioned, my grandpa literally told me. He was just like, oh, my God, I guess. And he was, like, at that point, I think 68, I think, when I I transitioned. Mm -hmm. And he was like, oh, you said that you were wired wrong when you were a kid. So I guess that makes sense. And it's actually kind of crazy, like, seeing him just accept it. and Yeah. Because he's, like, super country. Yeah. Did your family have a hard time accepting it? Uh, not really. Um, I'm not really close with my mom, mm-hmm. but my dad was kind of like, they just say a lot of ignorant things at first because like they don't know. Yeah. And then I kind of like took a break from my family for like a few years just because mm-hmm. like I was getting so upset and that like, I was insecure about my transition because I was like a brand new like baby pretty much. Mm-hmm. And so um, coming back, um, it was easy talking to them and like answering their questions. But um, no, everyone's really accepted. I remember my dad when I he found out that I was gay back when I was um in middle school. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was talking to a guy that I liked, and like he came around the corner with a phone in his ear. Cause remember how like all the phones are connected? Oh yes. And I'm just like, I gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he was kind of he was just like, I don't care if you're gay, but his thing was like masculinity. He was like. If you're going to be gay, just don't be the bitch in the relationship. And then I'm like, surprise. <laughs> now look. <laughs> it's interesting, like, that kind of um, kind of deal that he tried to make with you. Like, you can be gay but still be a man. I yeah. Because there, there's that sense, of course, if you're gay, like, you can't possibly be a man, which right. is, like, I've met some very masculine gay men. <laughs> Same. Yeah, for sure. So um, I, I – I want to ask you because you mentioned that, you know, as a kid, you imagined yourself as a woman growing up. And obviously this is a very contentious subject right now is like trans kids and educating them at a young age. And, you know, there's this whole fear about we're turning kids trans and do we notify the parents and just like all this up in arms. What's your perspective on all of that? So, ooh, this is a loaded question. So, um, I think that above all, you should just really have open communication with your child. Um, I don't think that hormones and surgery is like first thing on the table. Uh, just because like a lot of those times, I think that you're just exploring mm-hmm. what you like. Like mm-hmm. I didn't really dress, I dressed up as a girl like a couple of times when I was little, but I didn't like, I didn't do it regularly, mm-hmm. um, and it didn't kind of it didn't bring me the euphoria that some other people bring, like when they dress up and they're like, "Oh, it really felt good." Me, I was like, "Oh, it kind of feels silly because I'm a boy wearing a skirt." Mm-hmm. Uh, I feel like it wasn't until I really started like going to therapy and putting the puzzle pieces together that I was really like understanding what I wanted. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I do think that therapy is definitely really good for children mm-hmm. uh, when they're trans because um, they really need to learn those feelings and know if they're passing or if they're staying. Mm-hmm. Uh, because a lot of times, um, if you are dysphoric as a child, sometimes you do grow out of it. Mm-hmm. And I don't think that like 
pushing something into like medic medication is smart or pushing into like surgery is smart. But um, I think that like if you just really like let them explore, I think that's the most important thing. Mm -hmm. Do you think almost it's do you almost feel like we're putting like too much emphasis on it, like too much yes. pressure in terms of like you need to decide right now yes. what you are? Like Everybody wants to put a label on something. Yeah, and true. honestly, it's like when I was a child versus children today, like I feel like it was there wasn't a lot of like pushing just because like you're trying to figure out things your, your own self. Mm -hmm. uh, and then now it's like there's so much information being mm -hmm. pushed on the children that it's kind of like it's kind of hard to relate it to like my childhood because it, I feel like they're just incomparable at this point. Yeah. And I also feel like people are using a lot of this as like a political agenda. Oh, yeah, for sure. You know, it's definitely been weaponized yes. on both sides. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Um, I mean, does that make you, how does it make you feel about like when you see this kind of infighting in the trans community, you know, like Buck Angel is a good example, mm -hmm. you know, he speaks out against, you know, pushing people into transitioning and he interviews people who transition too early and they want to detransition yeah. and then people criticize him for being anti-trans, even though he's trans yeah. and it just, I don't know. First of all, I love Buck Angel. I love him too. Uh, because, I'll be honest. and he's just I I just like critical people, and I don't agree with everything that he says. Yeah. Uh, as much as like I don't agree with everything that like Dylan Mulvaney says or Blair White says, mm -hmm. like I I take some with a grain of salt, but at the same time, if you just blindly just go with something just because it feels good, mm -hmm. uh, and it's not realistic, then it's like I feel like it's really detrimental to the community. Mm -hmm. So I think going like being very critical of like okay. And middle ground because there's just so many moving parts and like especially with laws like and like um like with bathrooms or like like there's so many other things that are like crazy yeah um so when you were how old were you when you transitioned i was 21. okay so and maybe you can explain this to me a little bit better because you know i'm not i don't know too much about the science behind it i know that you know this idea of starting off you know, some kids before they reach puberty, right? You want to get the yeah. hormone blockers and they're, it makes transitioning to a woman easier. Um, how does that fit in with your choice to wait until later to do it? I mean, you know, cause to be honest, like, I'm sure, you know, like you're very passing. I yeah. mean, like you just, you're just like beautiful. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I don't know, maybe tell me why it's the argument for starting earlier or waiting might be. So for, so if it's for puberty blockers at the beginning, it's just because of um, when you reach puberty, you get a deeper voice, you get all this hair, uh, your bones start to grow. Uh, my face costed me uh, it's like 60 grand. Okay. So, so there's uh, more work that has to be done yeah, after yeah. the fact. And right. it's, and it's, a big battle with insurance too. I, I didn't go through insurance. I paid it myself. But a lot of times it's like, I know there's a big battle of like, oh, why do these people have cosmetic surgeries through insurance? But it's for your transition. And so it's like, if you don't start puberty blockers young and you go later, then it's like harder. I know my one friend, she started puberty blockers, I think, at, uh, or hormones. I think she started at 15. Mm -hmm. And, like, she's just, like, beautiful. Like, mm -hmm. she looks like a natural born. She's never had surgery and nothing like that. Mm -hmm. So it's really helped her. But at the same time, it's, like, not something that is, like, good for everybody. Mm -hmm. Especially, like, there are some things, like, if you start puberty blockers, then, like, sometimes, uh, like, you're, like, I feel like, um, like your penis starts to not grow. And so mm -hmm. when you want to get a SRS, sexual mm -hmm. excitement, mm -hmm. um, you don't have enough tissue, so you have to get a skin graft, which mm -hmm. is taking even more skin from something else. Mm -hmm. So it's like stopping development at a certain age is a pro and a con at the same time. Mm -hmm. So um, like That's I had such my- a hard decision to make. Yeah, no, there's literally, it's such a nuanced conversation that's yeah. never cut and dry that it's like, you win some and you lose some. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, so you mentioned that the penis stops growing and so there's less skin mm -hmm. for the SRS because they kind of invert the penis, Yeah, right? there's an inverted method. There's uh, one from your colon method. There's also one that's a pull-through that's, like, I think part of your abdomen. There's, like, a little, like, piece of just, like, membrane and they can pull it down mm -hmm. and make a vagina with that. 
but there's a lot of different versions. But um, the, that version is like it's really hard to do. Yeah, yeah. All right, we're gonna take a quick commercial break, and then when we come back, um, I want to talk about your um, like the surgeries that you've had, uh-huh. and because um, you've got quite a bit of a story around that. <laughs> yeah. So uh, hang around, guys. We'll be right back. Hey there, podcast fam. Are you ready to add a little extra oomph to your game? Let's talk about Blue Chew. Picture this. You're like a superhero, but instead of a cape, you've got, well, an extra tool in your utility belt. Blue Chew is here to help you unleash your inner confidence and take your performance to the next level. With Blue Chew, you get access to the same active ingredients as those big name pills, you know, the ones that make you feel like a legend in the bedroom. But here's the twist. Blue Chew comes in a convenient, chewable form that works faster than a speeding bullet. It's also, surprise, cheaper. Say goodbye to those awkward pharmacy encounters or scheduling doctor's appointments. Blue Chew is prescribed online and delivered discreetly to your door. No muss, no fuss. Ready to take the plunge? Visit bluechew.com and score your first shipment for free by using the code HOLLY. Just cover a small shipping fee of $5. That's bluechew.com promo code Holly to conquer any doubts about your performance in the bedroom. Unleash your superhero self with Blue Chew because you deserve to feel invincible both in and out of the sheets. Hey guys, so welcome back. Okay, so Emma, so you've had quite a bit of gender affirming surgery, but I want to talk about the big one first. Um, you had your testicles removed. Yes. So <laughs> what made you decide to do that? And then what was the experience like? So I actually got it really, really early, like too early, honestly. Mm. My friend talked me into it. Um, I was taking spiractolone, which is an androgen blocker, so it blocks your testosterone. Mm -hmm. But I was getting, like, I was super dehydrated. I was getting the worst back pain, and, like, my whole neck was just, like, like on a scale of one to ten, it was like an eight pain all the time. Ugh. And Spiro is actually really, really bad for you. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like a lot of girls should start taking glutamine instead, but that's definitely up to the doctor. Mm-hmm. Uh, but um, yeah, it was four months into my transition, which is not supposed to happen, honestly. But mm-hmm. uh, I went to this doctor. Um, I was awake. And so my two other friends went to him, and I was like, okay, this is fine. So I lay down and like... The most painful part is just like this big lidocaine needle going in each testicle and to numb it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh God. That one was, I will still ever for, remember that pain. And then, um, and I was laying there and then he's like, Oh, do you feel that? And I was like, feel what? And he's like, oh, I'm just cutting you open. And so I don't know what possessed me to look down. <laughs> and I looked down and it looked like cherry pie. And I was like, <laughs> so <laughs> gross I started like heaving and he was like do not throw up right now and I was like no <laughs> wait you should have like a curtain up or something so you couldn't see no, literally I'm like oh no because they do the that worst? for you when they do a c-section they put up a curtain oh, so you don't see because they have to take dude, your intestines out yeah. in order to take the baby out so you don't it have to look at a, it it was such a crazy experience and then also while he's doing that like that's numb but like you can feel all of like the cords in your stomach like you can feel everything being pulled and I'm like oh it was it was I had big balls though honestly he had them on the table and I was like oh my god (laughs) (laughs) it was was very surprising I think honestly they were big because it wasn't I didn't give enough time to have them shrink from testosterone blockers right okay because usually they'll shrivel up to little things but no I they were big as balls (laughs) is that okay so is that what they suggest because you said that you got it done a little early so is it suggested that you wait until they shrink before you do that? So um, a lot of times they don't want you to do it. If you're getting SRS, they don't want you to do it until um, you do the surgery because mm-hmm. then a lot of times the the tissue, it can atrophy, it can die, you can lose sensation from um, the the orchiectomy. So um, sometimes girls get it and um, I do testosterone cream. Mm-hmm. So it helps um, the the tissue stay alive and healthy, but also it doesn't like bring my testosterone up to like a male level. Mm-hmm. Wow. And then what did you do with your testicles afterwards? So I was able to bring them home. That's so why I will never say his name because he could lose his license. Okay. Uh, and then like I was literally just like in so much pain 
And I'm thinking, and I'm like, how do I put this in my luggage? Because I just had a carry-on. And I'm like, there's no way that I'm going to be able to fly with these. So my friend was taking a bath at the time. And I went over there, and I was like, hey. And, of course, I'm, like, doped up on pain pills. Yeah, of course. And I just chunk it at her. And literally, and I have a video of literally landing right there on the side of the tub. And she's like, you nasty motherfucker. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't know what to do with them. She's like, throw them down the toilet. <laughs> So then I flushed him down the toilet. Oh, my God. And I'm like, there goes the rest of my manhood. Goodbye. (laughs) (laughs) Do you, like, do you wish you kept them now? Sometimes. Okay. Um, Honestly, sometimes I, like... I miss being able to come for like scenes. Like some, mm-hmm. I still be, I can still ejaculate, mm-hmm. but, um, and it can still come out, but it's like, I don't know. It's cute. It's not really like, it's, meow. it's cute. It's, it's cute. cute. <laughs> <laughs> That's a cute little cum shot. It is. It's like a little dribble, but honestly, like given that there is no balls, that is really hard to do, uh-huh. but, um, it's because your, I think your sperm comes from your, testicles and your semen comes from your prostate so the clear fluid comes from your prostate okay so though you don't have the testicles anymore you're still getting the semen coming through yeah the prostate so is that something that you have to work at doing like if when when you're ever you're having like a personal experience with somebody or even say masturbating does that happen normally or oh no? yeah I'm, okay. it's pretty easy if i'm really like in the mood mm-hmm. uh but also it's like even on scenes when i have to like work up to a cum shot I can just like close my eyes and just go for it and mm-hmm. then like okay I'm ready in like five minutes oh so wow. it's nice I don't have to watch like and a lot of guys have to like watch porn yes. like, and I'm like how are you gonna watch porn on a porn set it's like inception <laughs> I know right there's been so many times that like you know the guy disappears to the bathroom yeah and like well all right <laughs> wait, wait for my cum wait. shot <laughs> yeah. so um did castration affect your penis size at all it did. So it shrunk. It shrunk about like over an inch, honestly. It used to be like six, six and a half, and mm-hmm. now I'm like a solid five. Mm-hmm. And do you care about that? I mean, I do only because when a director is like more length, I'm like, go underneath <laughs> because I cannot pull out anymore. <laughs> so it is nice. Like, I was so insecure about my dick size until. In my personal life, I started making, like, a lot of, like, girls squirt. Mm-hmm. And, like, a lot of girls, like, come and they're just like, no, your dick is, like, great. Mm-hmm. And it's because, like, it's small. It's, well, it's not small. It's average. It's average. Uh, but it's, like, curved right up. So it okay. curves, like, so that's, like, the perfect size for both men and women. Mm-hmm. So it hits your prostate or hits your G-spot. And so, like, when I, in my personal life, when I started making people come, like, I became more of a top throughout my porn career. Mm-hmm. That was when I was like, oh, actually, it is a nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I'm sure as you you know, like so many men have their masculinity wrapped around the size of their penis. Yeah. So it sounds like you have a different view on that. I used to. Mm-hmm. I feel like before, well, even before my transition, I feel like I was like a complete and utter bottom. Like I only mm. like dick. I was like never ever topped. And then like throughout my transition and throughout porn, I really like I don't really bottom as much as anymore as I used to. Uh, and it's, it's just a lot of work, honestly. <laughs> Bottoming is a lot of work. Bottoming is a lot of work. I'd rather top. And so, so how how is bottoming more work? Bottom because you got to clean out, and also it's like I feel like you have to be really in the mood, mm-hmm. and I feel like working and bottoming for like porn. I feel like it kind of like lost its like luster mm-hmm. for me. I think that topping is just better because I'm more I like being in control. Okay. Plus, I feel like with my fans, I um, have a lot of like guys who want to be submissive or like that are like like specification or like humiliation and I've really like started liking that in my personal life Mm. uh my go-to porn when I first started porn was POV anal like I love watching like like a girl take it in her ass because like Mm -hmm. it's different for her because like she's a pussy so it's like it feels like it's like naughtier Mm -hmm. but then now I watch a lot of like cuckold (laughs) cuckold Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's just nice and like it's just hot mm-hmm. so it like fits with your personality yeah. more right so you prefer to top yeah do you do you bottom at all anymore or I do, do you get to I think choose I, I bottom for like people that I like and mm-hmm. then also I don't know I, I really have been loving getting strapped on by a girl okay uh, so April Olsen took my strap virginity two years ago okay. on Jim Power set. And then uh, Emma Magnolia, uh, we just had a scene where she topped with the strap on. And so I really want to uh, explore that side of my life. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just broke up 
well, not just, I broke up with my ex back in February. And like one of the big reasons for him, I told him, was like, I just need someone more queer. Mm -hmm. So I cannot be with a straight guy anymore. I can't be with like a full like lesbian. I need someone who is like bisexual, who's versatile, who's open. Mm -hmm. I need someone who's just like me to really just like, like to explore and like do everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I want to go back to that, to your boyfriend, but before we go there, um, so what is the benefits of getting castrated as a trans woman? Uh, I think that everyone's different. So sometimes you could lose like your ability to get hard or your libido completely. So that is a con. I don't know how I'm the horny all the time. <laughs> so Were you worried about that happening? I was you? worried, yeah, because like you don't have testosterone, but at the same time, testosterone isn't what causes arousal or your libido. Like there's so many other moving aspects. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that it's nice because I don't have to take testosterone. I'm never going to like revert or something like that if mm -hmm. I ever like get like stuck on an island or something. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, um, I'm way more stable because I feel mm -hmm. like if I am missing my doses, um, I don't have my testosterone spiking and that's not going to be like unlevel. It's kind of just like almost like menopause. Okay. Okay. Because I've had hot flashes. One time I didn't take hormones for three months and it was like hot flash. It was horrible. Really? Yeah. It was like sweating bullets and it was like 68 degrees in my house. So why did you, because you, you, do you need to be on medication for the rest of your life? Yeah. So why did you stop taking it for three months? Because I hate taking injections. Uh, so now I'm on the pills now because it's easy to okay. take it uh, twice a day. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. So um, I want to go back to – you mentioned your ex and you said that you don't want to be with a straight guy anymore. Yeah. So when you met him, did he know you were trans? Yes. So he was actually my neighbor. Okay. Uh, he was managing a model at the time. So mm -hmm. he used to manage models. And uh, we met in the parking lot. And he was like, oh, hey, is your name Emma Rose? And I was like, yeah. And I literally was like in my gym clothes. I was cleaning out my car. I looked like a mess. Mm -hmm. And um, at first I didn't want – I didn't think about dating him at all. Like it was just like, oh, it's nice. I can film with him. And it was just like working all the time. But then, of course, feelings started when you start hanging out with somebody every single day for like – five months, then mm -hmm. you start getting feelings. And um, there was some, like, issues with, like, masculinity and, like, him not wanting to bottom, which is very important to me in, like, a relationship. Mm -hmm. And so, like, he didn't want to do that. So I was like, okay, I'll respect that. But also I'm like... Mm. Yeah, because so, you like to talk. Yeah. And plus it's like I want to be able to... Um, I don't know. I always say I just want to suck dick with my partner. <laughs> so I want to be either a guy or a girl. I just want to be able to like have someone else, like a girl or a guy. And just and there's no like ifs or like mm -hmm. this like nervousness or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So because I mean, I'm just echoing what I know, like a lot of listeners are going to say and they're going to say, well, you can't be a straight man if you're right. dating a trans woman. So what would your response to that be? I think that. Everyone has a, like a personal like definition of what straight and gay is. And mm -hmm. there is no way that I can convince someone else that if I think this is straight and if you don't think it's straight, then it's like it's like a it is what it is. Mm -hmm. I do think that there's a lot of gray area because mm -hmm. um, I feel like there's so many different types of trans women out there. And there's even like there's a lot of tra uh, girl like like assigned female at birth that go by he, him, but still live as women. But like, even that's considered trans. So it's like, there's so many things now that's mm -hmm. like, it's like, yeah. And it makes my brain go in a fucking. Yeah. And it kind of goes back to what you said earlier about how everybody wants to label everything. Yeah. You know, um, I think that we really just um, are attuned to masculinity and femininity at the end of the day. Yeah. Uh, because, um, I think that guys who do like trans girls, they they like the femininity part, femininity part of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you see someone who's like really beautiful and like, oh, like they're actually trans, then it's like your brain's already liking the attraction. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some people that I've been with that they're like, okay, if you had a pussy, I would totally fuck you, but like I can't. I don't, mm -hmm. don't like dick. And I'm like, okay, that's mm -hmm. fine. Yeah. 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 No, I mean what you said about, you know, people – it's either like this fight between masculinity and femininity. Yeah. And we kind of don't allow for a lot of gray areas, which is confusing for a lot of people because a lot of 
trans women that I've spoken to says, you know, a lot of times like their clients or, you know, they go to like trans bars, it's a lot of like quote unquote straight men. Yeah. And so, you know, what does that mean? Does that yeah. mean that they just are interested in experimenting? You know, And it's like yeah. also this idea of like, okay, you're either a man or a woman. It's like, right. Like, could there not a lot of like a spectrum? Yeah, there could be. And you know, and then this is why I like kind of like the idea of like pansexual like yeah. that term. Like I just like people who I like, Yeah, you know, Same. like what they're working with is what they're working with. You know, that, that feels nice to me. Um, do you like, if you go out and you meet a guy, um, do you tell him that you're trans like, how does that conversation come up if so, it needs to? So it depends on if I want to be intimate with them or not. So mm-hmm. if I don't want to fuck them, I'm going to be like, okay, I'm not telling you. I'm going to get these drinks all night and then I'm going to ditch. <laughs> <laughs> because, like, at that point... I, like, it's none of his business. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, I'm not kissing him. I'll dance with him. But, mm-hmm. like, there's no groping. There's no nothing like that. Um, if I am feeling a vibe, if I really, like, am, like interested uh usually i'll tell them around like 20 minutes in uh, and i'm like hey like, That's I just pretty wanna, soon. yeah because i'm like there's the night is young i'm ready this to true. Like, you don't want to waste don't, your time exactly because yeah. there was one time i waited an hour and like we were on the balcony it was so nice i was like talking about like literally about life mm-hmm. and it was like such a good connection and then i was like oh yeah i wanted to let you know that like i am trans and he was like what the fuck? And like stormed off. It was such a abrupt that I was like, okay, I'm not wasting my time ever again on that. Yeah. Yeah. And you had a scary experience with somebody. Yeah. Once, that right. Was the when big, you first transitioned. Yeah. I thought it would never, ever happen again. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The beginning of my transition, I was very insecure with my transition mm-hmm. and um, I was with this guy and fucking buff beard just like fucking daddy um and i was like with his friends and i met him out and so we were talking and like i wanted to tell him i was trans but like he was with all of his friends yeah and so um anyways like we're drinking and of course i'm getting drunker and then uh we kind of end up at his hotel room with his friends and then when they're leaving i'm like okay i'm gonna leave too and he's like oh no no where are you going where are you going and i'm like Okay. Uh, and at that point, then I'm like, okay, I need to tell him. And he's just like, at that point, since his friends are leaving, he just like rips down my skirt. And of course, my dick fucking flops out. Mm-hmm. And I'm just like, like literally everything was so quiet that you could hear like a pin drop. Wow. And you can just see the anger on his face. Yeah. Just like, it just turned red. And, um, yeah, he told me, he was like, you're going to suck my fucking dick and get the fuck out and then choke the fuck out of me. And then, yeah, that was the last moment I cried. I was literally like, yeah, I was I was like sucking his dick and crying. So that was a moment to know your worth and to never do that again. <laughs> wow. That's also crazy that he was so angry that you were trans, but then still wanted to like I sexually think, punish uh, you That's honestly nuts. i think that he was attracted i yeah. think that he liked trans girls but also he was just so mad that he felt like to which i was un- un- dishonest so yeah. i understand but like that shit like that literally rape that's, yeah that's uncalled for yeah absolutely yeah was that that was I that mean, was a that was a very that's a pivotal moment i think that was like in my transition and yeah. I think also that after that moment is when I was really heavy into I want SRS uh-huh. uh, and then throughout like another year um, I was kind of like getting more um, comfortable in my body because I also like during that time I was, de- was kind of depressed because there was like so many shit ha- happening and I was like getting tired of dancing and I gained like 25 pounds mm-hmm. uh, and then so during uh, 2020 is uh, in 2019 and also starting porn I lost 25 pounds uh, I met so many people that were like love me for me mm-hmm. and it was so like it was so nice and like relieving and refreshing and that's when I really was like, was like oh okay I'm definitely gonna keep my dick <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah I was gonna ask you why you decided ending. to not why you decided to not fully transition yeah I think it's just I like it it feels good honestly I feel like especially like topping it just I don't know. Topping just won't feel as good with a shop on. Mm-hmm. Do you think that you would ever want to fully transition at some point? Or are you happy the way you are? 
I think that I would only get SRS for comfort Mm -hmm. just so I won't have to tuck anymore. Right, right. Do you wish that you lived in a world where you didn't have to explain to people that you were trans before you went out with them? That would be nice. (laughs) That'd be nice, but not realistic. (laughs) But honestly, I feel like at the beginning of my transition, it was kind of nice because I was like, noticeably trans Mm -hmm. so I don't say anything people would just know uh but I became very possible very quickly uh I feel like I was possible really like within a year uh because I had a very soft face before yeah and then when I gained the weight honestly it just made my face really really feminine yeah and then uh I had my facial surgery in 2021 uh, because I started my transition in 2017 I had my My butt done in 2020, my face done in 2021, and my tits done in 2022. So I waited like three full years to get a major surgery. Yeah. Um, And how did all those surgeries go? I mean, I've so I've had Lucy Hart on, and she's like described in detail about like everything that she's been through. And I know it's a lot. Were have all of them been pretty easy, or did you have any bad experiences? So, uh, well. I got silicone injections. I would never recommend them uh, for because I, I lost all the weight and I should have got a BBL when I had the weight. Mm-hmm. But especially like I feel like gaining weight and working and just like your brain, just like body dysmorphia out the ass. Yeah. <laughs> so I got silicone uh, and I take really good care of it. I massage it. You have to, like It's a lifetime investment. So if mm-hmm. you just get it. You have to take care of it. Mm-hmm. Um, so my face, I had it done in 2021. And uh, two weeks afterwards, I was like getting like swelling. And I was like, thought I was like eating too much salt. Mm-hmm. And um, it turned out that bacteria got in like where they um, cut here. Mm-hmm. And within two days, my face got so big. And I was trying to sleep. And I had like a hoodie on, I had sweats on, I had a blanket and I was shivering cold. And I was like, everything started getting like slurry and like blurry. So I drove to the hospital. Literally, You drove yourself? I drove myself because I was like, I'm not paying an ambulance bill. (laughs) So bad. And I go there and I'm like, I like at that point, my mask at the time won't fit over my face because it's Mm -hmm. so swollen. I had sepsis. Oh so God. literally, if I the doctor is like, if you went to, if you slept, you probably wouldn't have woken up. Wow. And I'm happy that I was like, oh, this is fucking bad. And so I had to do, and I had to have an emergency flight to San Francisco back to my doctor because at first that doctor in Vegas is gonna cut open my face from the outside, and I was like, no. Yeah. <laughs> so I flew back, and oh my God, it was like a horrible experience. It was during COVID in San Francisco, so I'm going in, and I'm like, hey, I'm gonna meet my doctor here, and they're like, oh, you need to get COVID tested, and I'm like. Did you see my face? <laughs> so I had to go outside because at that point I saw antibiotics they were giving me. Yeah. And then like the it was so gross because like the antibiotics was kind of killing it and it started gushing out of my mouth. <gasps> so it was just like thick, like pus chunky juice. And it was, ugh, it was Coming so out of your mouth? Yeah, because like when they redid my jaw, there was like two parts where like um like blood what were they called like the drains oh yeah yeah and so it was coming out where the drains used to be and it was just like it was just i keep spitting it out it was so oh, gross my God. Yeah. and then uh, at that point uh, i had my surgery no food and water for four days i just had an iv drip and antibiotics and honestly this cured my lactose intolerance <laughs> So I used to be lactose intolerant. Like, literally, I couldn't eat pizza. And at that point, I think that since it just killed every, my whole entire floor, everything in my stomach, like, now I can drink milk, eat milk, like, cheese. It, like, literally cured my lactose intolerance. That's crazy. Yeah. Well, silver lining, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. Wow. That is that is really terrifying. Um, so what's been your experience, like, dating? Well, actually, here. What's more difficult, dating as a porn star or dating as a trans woman? Oh, Lord Jesus. It's <laughs> a <laughs> <So> devil whammy. <Miami. laughs> uh, so I've only had four major boyfriends in my life. So so you prefer to date men? Uh, well, at this point right now, I want to date a girl. That's my, that's my next goal. I feel like my, you I want, want to. I want to. Okay. I've never had like the opportunity to. Mm-hmm. Um, and... Yeah, two of them were during my career. My first one was when I first moved to Vegas. It was during COVID. It was short-lived, but very traumatic. Uh, And then my second one was a year and a half uh, relationship. But 
I went in different things. And, um, yeah, I just want someone way more, like, queer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like I was saying. It sounds like, like my, someone, like, more on your level. Yeah. And someone is, like, my match, I feel like. I think it's really hard to find someone my match sexually and financially and mm -hmm. emotionally. Like, all the things all in one. Mm -hmm. And I feel like the only person who would actually be my match would be a woman. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but also, um, it would just be, like, I want someone who doesn't see me as, like, the penetrator or, like, as, like, the, the, just because I'm a dick, that doesn't mean, like, I, I assume that role. Mm -hmm. So Yeah, I hear you. Yeah, I mean, one thing that I have heard from other Transformers I've had on is that, like, yeah, because they have a penis, like, they're always asked to use it in scenes and some don't want to yeah at all they kind of like don't even want to necessarily even acknowledge it yeah i like using it in scenes sometimes it's just the the positions they want to put me in i'm like i'm the smallest out of all the studio girls that are shooting like top studio scenes mm -hmm. i'm the smallest dig out of all the girls mm -hmm. and sometimes they want me to do like a like a, a train mm -hmm. where it's like i'm the caboose and i'm like I'm trying to like get my legs in and I'm like, you can't see anything because <laughs> all the other girls are like eight inches, seven inches, yeah. like, like long dicks. And I'm like, I'm just petite over here. Yeah. I mean, that's like the thing, you know, when people are like, why are all the dicks and porn so big? I'm like, it's literally a logistical right. thing with like camera angles and stuff like yeah. that. It's not, I mean, obviously porn is also a fantasy, but it doesn't mean that like yeah. big dicks are the only way to go. It yeah. Just, Cause you can't, it, it, I'm like, just, you big boned ass. <laughs> <laughs> so then were you surprised when you won Trans Performer of the Year? Uh, for AVN, I I wasn't that surprised. Mm -hmm. I was just like betting on it because I worked my ass off in 2022. Um, Casey Kisses won that, that year. And um, I was just like... I it's gonna be my third year. Even at the beginning of my my career, I was like, my third year, I'm gonna take it all. And mm -hmm. honestly, I did. It was very crazy. But uh, 2022, I was like taking every scene. Director's like, are you available? And I'm from Vegas, so mm -hmm. I'm like, I would just catch a flight the next morning and be like, okay, I'm packing my bags right now and just going back and forth all the time. And uh, I I would I would like to say that I was surprised, but honestly, I feel like I worked really really hard for it, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm really happy. Uh, this upcoming year, I don't know, it's anybody's game. Yeah. So yeah. there's so many good performers now this year that have, like, stepped up and are just amazing. So. Yeah. Well, I feel like it's fair to feel that you earned that. Yeah. You know, to, like, feel that you put in the work and you got what you deserve. What surprised me was that when I won AVN and then I won Expos Transform the Year and then I won T performer of the year, and then I won Pornhub performer of the year, all back to back in the wow. same year, and like no other trans girl's ever done that. Yeah, and I'm just like, ah, so crazy. Where do you do you have like a display shelf? Oh uh, yeah, I do. <laughs> and in my office, I have, uh, but I'm about to get um, all the lights wired in them, so it'll be all nice and pretty. Oh, perfect. Yeah, yeah, that sounds amazing. So, what has porn helped you learn about yourself as a trans woman that you may not have discovered otherwise? Oh, God, that's a good question. Because I could be like, oh, I'm making a top. But I've like, already said that. I feel like, um, can you repeat the question one more time? Sure. What has porn helped you learn about yourself as a trans woman that you may not have discovered otherwise? I feel it just about how you just, I don't know. I don't even know how to word this. Like if it's mostly like other people because I didn't realize how many people watch trans porn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so uh, it kind of made me feel good about being a trans woman because like I'll walk down the road. I was like walking in New York uh, and like two people in one day. I was like, oh my God, are you Emma Rose? And I'm just like, holy shit. And now I'm recognized like one, at least once a month. Mm -hmm. And like for even that to happen, it's just amazing how many people are watching trans porn mm -hmm. or like watching what I'm doing. Not even porn, just like in general, because some things I do with like Krill was here or other podcasts and stuff. But it's like, I feel like without porn, I would never have gotten the understanding of just like, I don't know, how normal trans is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I feel like that's the best way to put it. Yeah, I mean, it, it sounds like it made you feel valued. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the adult community is, you know, what, it's a very accepting, like, open arms community. Yeah, you know, you feel sure. weird and other in other places, like, 
generally the porn community is going to embrace you. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's kind of like what I love the most about it. You know, someone referred to us as like an island of the misfit toys, you know yes. what I mean? But which is kind of true. And I was talking to a friend of mine who is, you know, directing now. And initially, like, he only wanted to direct mainstream. I actually pulled him into the adult industry yeah. with the whole, like, oh, just shoot the striptease part of, like, because I used to shoot all the yeah. Tristies, Treat of the Month stuff. Just shoot the tr- tr- uh, the striptease part at the beginning. He would leave the room for the masturbation because he was just like, <laughs> I, can't, like I can't, I can't yeah. be there. I'm like, just the, the tame stuff, then you can go yeah. home. And now he's, like, full-on directing. He was shooting a lot of stuff um, for uh, adult times, like mm-hmm. Transline. Yeah. You've probably worked with him. But anyways, we were talking about the adult industry and like now why he yeah. loves working it so much. And we were saying like, it's kind of like, it's not even about the porn. It's not even about the shooting the sex. It's sex. Like, it's about the people and like the way that it's just a really open community that presents a lot of opportunities to create the kind of artistic stuff that you would have a really hard time pulling off yeah. in mainstream, you well, know? that's the same thing with um, every makeup artist I talk to mm-hmm. who's worked in mainstream, who's been celebrity makeup artists, and they're just like, I moved to porn because it's like, it's funner, it's like you meet people, it's like you're actually valued. Like when you're working in a lot of times mainstream, like you're kind of like overlooked for your work and yeah. not treated as like a person. And like anything that you do is like, mm, not good enough pretty yeah. much anything with porn like it's just so artistic and you can be really like genuine mm-hmm. and like really like love what you do yeah i i appreciate what you said about like the valued thing and that's so true because i think there's just a lot less micromanaging yeah for you sure. know there's so much micromanaging and mainstream and that was kind of the, one of the things that my mom loved about shooting porn which is like mm-hmm. why she got into it initially was you didn't have like an art director yeah. breathing down your neck and there's yeah. a lot of companies that will let you do kind of whatever you want. We'll yeah. give you creative freedom. And now with platforms like OnlyFans and stuff, now you're making your own money yeah. to do whatever you want. And like that doesn't exist in mainstream. It really yeah. doesn't. No, not at all. Yeah. So I mean, I I love porn. Not the sex is like whatever. <laughs> it's everything. I, like else. <laughs> I mean, the sex is fine. Yeah. I mean, for me as a director, it's like the part where I'm just like, okay, you guys know what you're doing. <laughs> so everything else I'm like so focused on, you know. I just shot uh, for Dorsal um, for um, their new movie, More. Oh, yeah. I yeah. saw the trailer. It it's looks amazing. So You're the I DJ. Just, I watched it. Yeah, yeah. Yes. The scene was so good. I was shooting with Casey Calvert and mm-hmm. Kira Noir. And there's this one Two part. Oh, performers. I love, I love, love, Both love. Both of them. Um, Ricky was actually, he was just like, I don't even want, like, because it was like a 45-minute scene. And... Uh, I was ready to fuck. I was like, I'm ready. And he's just like, I don't even want penetration. And I was just like, okay. <laughs> but wow. it was so, it, cause it was so sensual and beautiful and hot. There was one part I was bouncing one foot and my leg, I'm like holding it up and like they're going on both sides. And it was just like heaven. <laughs> Absolutely amazing. Yeah. It's nice to love your job, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so have you ever experienced any kind of like transphobia in the adult industry Yes, I have. I am a squeaky wheel when it comes to messaging directors and studios about working with trans girls. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because I'm like, the market's there. It's very lucrative, honestly. It's like if you take your personal beliefs aside, trans cells. Mm -hmm. Uh, I said that very clearly in my avian speech because um, an agency... I wanted to work with, I hit them up a year before my win. And I was like, hey, would you ever have a trans girl on your roster? And they're just like, oh, that's not something that we're looking into right now. I was like, okay. And then uh, in December, I asked them again, same answer. Mm-hmm. And then the day after I won my my award, after when I said into the agencies, studios, and directors that thinks that trans doesn't sell, it does. Mm-hmm. And the next day they hit me up saying, oh, we want to talk about representation. And I'm just like, for fucking real right now. <laughs> Are you serious? Did you tell them to go fuck themselves? Uh, yeah, I did. And then I went back and I was like, maybe. And I listened to them again at pitch and I was like, you know what? It's just not worth it. Yeah. So. Do you even feel that like you need an agency at this point? I am. I have like on and off talks with uh, a really big agent 
because mm-hmm. he would just be amazing. But he even told me it was Spiegler. Yeah, I had a meeting with I him. I had a feeling. Yeah. I knew right away who you were talking Spiegler. about. And he was just like, honestly, he's like, I just, I want to be able to help you. And he's like, I can help you like not being your agent because like, I don't know the, the scenes. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, it would, be, it would be like me teaching him and him teaching me. Yeah. But uh, my biggest thing, what I would really, really want to do is I want to work for Vixen Media Group mm-hmm. so bad. I want to be, I, I just love... I love the stories. I love everything like that. Mm-hmm. Like, sorry, I love Ricky Greenwood, like when he does all these movies, mm-hmm. because it's just everything, how it's shot, how the storyline goes. It's just, I like, I like the effort. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, yeah. So that's <laughs> bucket list. It is a bucket list. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I think that, I, I think trans has come a long way, especially since I've been in the industry, you know, and um, I wouldn't rule anything out. Right. It's like patience. Yeah. And I think, <laughs> very, you know, women like you are really kind of forging a path and, you know, everybody else will come to their senses at yes. some point. My other outlandish, crazy, crazy goals in my whole entire life. I want to be on penthouse. <laughs> One of these days, I'm like, if they ever do, I think that would just, that's like my, I feel like my most outlandish goal. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because it's like never, ever been done, ever. But one can dream. (laughs) I mean, you know, Playboy did it. Yeah. And that got a lot of attention. Yeah, Playboy. And then, because I know they have the centerfold too now. And then Hustler. And then, um, yeah, Penthouse. Would just be crazy. Mm. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. Stranger things have happened. Um, all right, Emma. So before we wrap up, I want to ask you a question from a Patreon member, Mark. Um, so he says, as a woman, how do you think we can heal the divide and complete lack of understanding of the part of society that is up in arms over trans athletes in the women designated shower rooms and restrooms? It's a loaded question. <laughs> so many loaded questions today. Right. Um, honestly, I think um, respect goes both ways on mm-hmm. both sides. Um, when it comes to women and women like me, uh, a lot of times, like I know cisgendered is a very polarizing term. Uh, so a lot of women don't like being called that. Um, even though a lot of trans women will be like, hey, it's just like uh, it's just like a signifier. It's just Latin. Mm-hmm. And that's why also sometimes I'll just say women like me instead of trans women mm-hmm. because like it's like labels. It's uh, People want to put labels on everything. But as I was saying, respect goes both ways. And sometimes I think it really goes up to like the businesses. Um, so if it is like unisex, Sometimes there isn't funding for a business to put something that's unisex or to put Mm -hmm. a single bathroom. So it makes it really uncomfortable for some trans women. Mm. Uh, Personally, I use the women's bathroom, but any facilities like uh, like if I'm changing or anything, I just won't take my bottoms off Mm -hmm. uh, because like I don't want to expose my genitalia to anything that's like a woman's space Mm -hmm. just because I feel like I don't know. I, I feel like I just feel like very other at that point and mm-hmm. I just do not feel comfortable. Yeah. No, I uh, and then as for trans athletes, I think that there is so much more research to be done by the committees and they're trying the hardest. I know like there's so many like polarizing things where it's like, yeah, like you have muscle mass and then like if you take a testosterone, if you take out the testosterone, like if you like got an orchiectomy and like you lose all this muscle mass, are you still able to perform or compete? It's like, Personally, I'm like, it depends on the sport. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Some sports are fine. Some sports aren't. But um, I think that recently, I think like the chess, I think I heard like chess, they banned trans women from competing in the world chess thing, something like that. Chess? Yeah, chess. Like chess, like the move, sit on your ass and move the pieces around Yeah, I think they just, I I think they, they banned trans women from the women's league. Hmm. Because there is one part that goes together. So it's like very like... It's very weird out there. Mm-hmm. So I, I actually have no answer. Me personally, I feel like uh, it boils down to transitioning early, but mm-hmm. also that's a whole entire can of worms. So it's like if you transition early, that means you're transitioning as a youth. And then that right. goes into being able to be an athlete. So right. it's like everything is so um, like convoluted. Is it convoluted is the yeah. word? Yeah. yeah. Everything is so convoluted and intertwined. That's like you can't talk about trans athletes without talking about trans youth and all of that. So it's like, ugh. 
Yeah, that is complicated. Yeah. <laughs> That's definitely more complicated than I really Yeah, like thought when you really sit about. down and like think because people are like, Oh, you can't compete because you're a man. Mm -hmm. But then if you transition early and you never get the testosterone, you never get the muscle mass, you never get the bone density. Right. Then and it's a lot then of times. You, then is it fair to say you're a woman because you didn't? Because yeah, if we're talking about the physical differences between a man and a woman. Yeah, exactly. So it's like very there's layers. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna leave that up to the experts <laughs> to figure out. <laughs> Same. <laughs> well, Emma, thank you so much for coming thank on. Thank you today. so much. It has been such a pleasure to get to know you. Um, can you tell everybody where they can find you online, please? You can find me at ohitsemmarose.com. All of my socials are ohitsemmarose or I want emmarose.com forward slash links. Fantastic. And you guys can find me at Holly Randall on Instagram and on Twitter. Go to hollylinks.com for access to all my social media platforms. And of course, if you want to watch these episodes as they're streamed live, go to my Patreon, patreon.com slash hollyrandallunfiltered. Thank you guys so much, and I'll see you next week. Bye.